When people die, it's up to the rest of us who are still here to tell their life stories. That's how they live on. And that's why we call this podcast Immortalized. Welcome back to Immortalized. I am Steven Siegel from Legacy.com, the world's largest network of obituaries. And with me is Legacy's news editor, Linnea Crowther. Linnea, what have you seen in the obituaries lately? You know, I have been writing so many obituaries lately for people who died in their mid to late 90s, sometimes even over 100, who are some of the very last people who fought in World War II or were, uh, you know, a major part of the war effort here at home during World War II. So many of them uh, just in the last, you know, year or two. I guess we're reaching the tail end almost in a way of a whole generation, aren't we? Well, we are. You know, when you think about it, uh, say that you were 18 years old in 1945 when the war was, you know, winding to a close and you decided to sign up so that you could you could fight. At this point, you're 94 if you were 18 in 1945. And those are just the very youngest veterans. Of course, there were people who were fighting who were even substantially older than that. So, yeah, just the the facts of the human lifespan means that that the numbers of remaining World War II vets and and, uh, at-home support are definitely dwindling. So the obituaries, the stories of these people's lives were at a point where Remembering them now is all the more vital because there's only so many more that we have to hold on to and preserve and celebrate. And I feel like I learn something every time I read or even more so uh, research and write an obituary for one of these people. I'm, I'm learning a richer history of World War II than what I think I learned in school. You know, my grandfather was a Marine. Um, he was actually at Pearl Harbor. Um, And he would never talk about that in any sort of dramatic terms or or anything that would, you know, upset either himself or anyone in the family. You know, he always insisted to us that he slept through the attack on Pearl Harbor. You know, he was in his bunk and by the time he was awake, it was over. Um, I have no idea whether that's true or not. And, you know, he, he would always very much kind of downplay what he did in the war. You know, he would just talk about, oh, yeah, I, they kept us in the in the uniforms and my toes were crammed into boots and I got fungus on my toe. Um, and those were the sorts of stories he would tell. But my father actually came across a photograph, uh, an old historic military photo that appeared in the World Book Encyclopedia. It was actually, if you looked up World War II, in the world book, in the section on the war in the Pacific, there was this big black and white photo of a bunch of Marines on the island of Tarawa in the Pacific, um, sort of pinned down on, on a beach behind fallen trees with their rifles. And right in the middle of the photo, there's a Marine with his rifle and he's turned back to look over his shoulder where the cameraman is and it's my grandfather that's cool um it's you know it's unmistakably him Uh um and having that record of a piece of his story it's such a different way to engage with all of these huge events that happened before i was you know ever alive um and it feels like obituaries when we're saying goodbye to people are another opportunity to like take that sort of moment and that sort of, you know, connection to the history and and really make it real. You know, what you said about your grandfather never really wanting to talk about his experience fighting the war, I think is so common. And I've certainly seen that, you know, you, you'll see it in the family placed obituaries. I feel like all the time, you know, dad or grandpa fought in World War II, but he never really wanted to talk about it or didn't want to give details or didn't want to talk about the bad parts, which of course there were things that were, uh, you know, traumatizing that, that these young men went through. 
But then there are men who were willing to talk about it and wanted to to share their stories and keep that history alive. And those are where we get some of these fascinating obits that we write uh, as part of our notable death section on Legacy.com, where we're featuring you know, both famous and just fascinating people. That's where we get a lot of these is the men who did want to share their stories and women who wanted to share their stories from uh, being home supporting the war effort. And there are so many of those that I've written just in the last year or two, telling the story of these last vets of World War II uh, and preserving that history through their own experiences and, and their own words as they shared those experiences. So let's talk about those today. These stories of amazing people whose lives intersected with the biggest war in the history of the world and whom we're saying goodbye to now. So you, you wrote recently about a World War II Army Air Corps veteran named Bill Wynn and his dog. Yes, his dog Smokey, who was a war hero. Uh, I loved this story. So Bill Wynn found this little Yorkie in the jungle when he was fighting in the Pacific theater. And, you know, Yorkies are these little yip dogs that you would not really think of as being a potential war hero, right? Not at all. Uh, And then he started training Smokey. And at first it was things like, well, he played the harmonica and he trained Smokey to, to, you know, sing, air quotes, sing along while he played. I think she would howl. (laughs) But then... There was more to it than just training this dog to be entertainment. Uh, where he was serving, the, they needed to dig a trench to lay some uh, communications cable underground. And this was going to be a big job that was going to keep dozens of people out in the open doing this digging for days. They would be exposed to you know enemy aircraft that might be flying over. And this was not a, a really appealing prospect to do it. But Bill Wynn said, let's see what happens if we attach this cable to Smokey's collar and send her through a culvert that's already there. It's buried underground, but it's too small for a person to get through. Let's see what happens if we can get Smokey to drag this cable through the culvert. So they they do it. They attach the cable to her collar. He's on the other end of this hundreds of feet long culvert calling her. She can't even see him at first. He's so far away. But this little yip dog did it. She ran through the culvert. She came to him with the cable attached to her collar. And they were able to, uh, you know, do this communications job that they were doing without having to expose all of these soldiers to danger by by digging the trench. She became this wonderful little mascot that everybody was so proud of her for doing this job and potentially saving lives. That's really something. You, you know, you think about animals in the war and you think about horses and you know, you think about Hannibal's elephants and... And maybe a bigger dog like German Shepherds maybe right. you would think of, but not right. Yorkies. That's really something. Her story continues beyond the war. Uh, I think she was so fascinating. He was injured later and was in the hospital for a while, in a military hospital, and he brought Smokey with him. And one of the nurses would would borrow her and take her around to visit the other soldiers. And she was just such a cute little peppy dog that she would lift their spirits. And she's considered the first therapy dog. And, you know, that's a big thing now. Sometimes when you're in the hospital, you'll have a therapy dog come visit you. And it's just the nicest thing. And Smokey was not only a war hero, but a hero to the sick by becoming the first therapy dog. That is such an incredible story. There are so many obituaries that mention people's pets, um, but I don't think I've ever seen one where the two life stories were that profoundly intertwined. Yeah, you can really tell from from Bill Wynn's stories just how devoted he was to this dog and how proud he was to be the trainer of a war hero dog. Uh, it was a, a great relationship that they had. You know, the popular image in our heads of World War II today you know, the better part of a century later is that kind of cinematic vision of allied soldiers on D-Day storming Normandy Beach, right? But these kinds of stories like Bill Wynn and Smokey remind us that there are so many incredibly different kinds of World War II stories out there to, to tell and to preserve. Yeah. And like I said, that's what I'm learning as an obituary writer and, you know, connoisseur as I read these obits from the World War II era. 
is just how many different stories and getting into the details of things like the Navajo code talkers and other other Native American languages. There was a whole group of Native American soldiers who used their native languages to transmit information. One of the Marine veterans who did this uh, was Joe Vandiver, and he died last year. He was a Navajo code talker. There were also Choctaw, Mohawk, uh, and Cree, and many other uh, Native American languages that were used for this code. But Navajo was the most effective of them. In fact, no message that these Navajo code talkers transmitted was ever translated. Not a single one. It was 100% successful. Wow. And uh, and so Joe Vandiver was one of these code talkers, and he was very proud after the war of his accomplishment. One of the quotes that, that I found from him when I was learning about him was that he said, our language is powerful when he was talking about the great success of this program. Uh, and one one note that I found kind of charming as I was as I was learning more about the Navajo code talkers was there were some words that were important in military communications that didn't translate into these Native American languages like uh, submarines. So they would call it uh, an iron fish. They would translate it to iron fish in their language. They translated Adolf Hitler to crazy white man. <laughs> that is one of the great understatements of history, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, that's good. So during the war, there were several hundred of these code talkers, maybe as many as 500. And apparently, uh, with after Vandiver died last year, there are only four of the Navajo code talkers still living. Once again, this is a situation where we're just, there, there are a few left and they're all in their mid to late 90s. So that idea that Vandiver said, that language is powerful, really underlines how the code talkers were one of these groups of people who did work that wasn't combat, but was still tremendously vital to making the war effort a success. That also included a lot of things that were happening back home in America. Yeah, there were so many women and men who were not able to go fight, but wanted to be a part of the war effort and were able to do things here at home to help. For instance, all of the manufacturing industries that had to ramp up God knows how many, you know, multiples of, of production in order to actually make the equipment that the armed forces were bringing overseas. And, you know, famously, as all of the young men were being sent overseas to battle, you have women in America suddenly working in large numbers in the factories, right? So there was this iconic image of the American woman at work. And in the slogans of the day, they called her Rosie the Riveter. And you've seen that famous picture, that illustration in bright red and blue and yellow of a young woman in a bandana flexing her bicep. And it says, we can do it. And that picture sort of became the familiar face of the American woman during World War II, right? Yeah. And it's not just symbolic. That was a real person. Really? Well, it's kind of a composite, but there was a real Rosie the Riveter. Her name was Rosalind P. Walter, and she was an heiress. In fact, she was very rich, but she didn't want to sit back and just enjoy her money during the war. She wanted to help out just like so many other women and men did. So she was working at an aircraft factory in Connecticut, and she was actually riveting. She was she drove rivets into fighter planes uh, as as part of the war effort. So she was riveting not just as an adjective, <laughs> but right. as an action. Yes, she was. She was a riveter, and she riveted. You know, her story kind of got around because she was an heiress, because she was so rich, and could have just enjoyed her you know wonderful privileged life. But but she didn't. She pitched in. Uh, just like so many other people did. And this this got some attention because didn't have to, but did. That's a good story. And so a newspaper columnist told her story in, in his column. And that column got around to some songwriters who wrote a song called Rosie the Riveter, which became a very popular song during the war. People loved this idea of this you know young woman pitching in at home. 
And this drove a lot of other women to sign up uh, and help out at factories and other places where they were needed at home. And, and, you know, it just it kept snowballing. This image of Rosie the Riveter became a bigger and bigger deal until Norman Rockwell painted this iconic We Can Do It poster. Now, the picture on the poster is not actually uh, Rosalind P. Walter, but she is the person who inspired the concept of Rosie the Riveter. And... Rosalind Walter just died last year, but I seem to recall seeing only a couple years before that, the woman whose picture became that poster also passed away and we had published her obituary, Naomi Fraley. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's so interesting to read these stories of how someone just living their life was captured by a photographer and you know, escalated into a historic moment. You know, Naomi Fraley was just working one day at the Naval Air Station in Alameda. And I don't think she had any inclination that someone would happen to snap her picture and then an artist would happen to use that as reference. A random moment from her life became the snapshot of a historical era. That, that is still so inspirational to people today. It, it's certainly still associated with World War II, but it's it's grown so far beyond that. People, w- you know, so many women look at that poster and think of that as inspiration for whatever they want to be able to do, you know, still today. Absolutely. You know, another group of World War II veterans that we have had to write a lot of obits for recently in the past couple of years are the Tuskegee Airmen. And the Tuskegee Airmen was the historic group of Black American military pilots and their support staff. For those who may not be familiar with this piece of history, the armed forces were still completely racially segregated when World War II started. And so all of the Black pilots trained at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And then they were grouped into their own four fighter squadrons and four bomber squadrons. You know, I'm sure you can imagine that the Tuskegee Airmen experienced a lot of racism. It was a time when that was just considered normal, both in the military and when they came home. They they experienced racism. But in fact, they were among the most successful fighter pilots in the war. There, there's a legend that says that no Tuskegee Airman was ever shot down. And, and that's not entirely true, but very few comparatively were. They they did a great job. They were feared by the Germans. And just a small percentage of them were actually lost in combat. So you've written any number of obits um, over the past couple of years for the last of the Tuskegee Airmen, as these veterans have been in their in their 90s. Um, tell us about a few of the most recent ones. Yeah, there's really just a handful of them still living. And one who I just wrote about a little bit earlier this year was Robert Ashby. He was a pilot in the Air Force during World War II. Well, at the time it was called the Army Air Forces. He did experience, like I said, trouble with racism during the war. He was assigned to some all-white squadrons that just wouldn't accept him. But then he was finally placed in a black company. Uh, He was able to fly. And he remained in the Air Force after World War II. He flew bombers in the Korean War, and he continued to serve through 1965. And then he distinguished himself even more by becoming the first black pilot for Frontier Airlines. Amazingly, he was as far as anyone knows, the only Tuskegee Airman who became a pilot for a commercial airline. Really? All of these hundreds of men who were trained to fly in the war, and certainly many of them continued to fly after the war, but but for a major airline, as far as we know, he was the only one. That's a remarkable story. And you know, The Tuskegee Airmen were not just pilots, but they were also the support staff that are necessary to keep those pilots in the air, you know, the mechanics and the navigators and all the other jobs. And because of that segregation in the military at the time, those were also black soldiers doing those jobs. And one of those was Val Archer, who was an airplane mechanic and an instrument specialist. He went on to continue serving in the Air Force after the end of World War II. He served in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. 
and he became an instructor for ICBM squadrons. Huh. He was also one of the Tuskegee Airmen who, in 2013, were finally honored with the Congressional Gold Medal. They did not get a lot of military honors during World War II, but all those years later, they were given one of the highest honors. So speaking of highly decorated air veterans, one of the obituaries we've published this past year was for General Chuck Yeager, who is probably among the most renowned and and publicly known uh, Air Force veterans in American history. He made headlines a few years after the war when he was the first pilot to ever fly faster than the speed of sound as a test pilot working at Edwards Air Force Base in the late 40s, early 50s. But as a fighter pilot during the war, Jaeger was not only what they called an ace, which is a fighter pilot who has shot down five enemy planes on missions. He had the rare distinction of becoming an ace in a single day, which was almost unheard of. But, you know, as amazing as that was, somehow we remember him even more for his work as a test pilot. Of course. And, you know, it's interesting. You look at General Yeager's obituary on Legacy, and there are all these condolences left by people who may not have known him personally, but were really inspired by his life story and wanted to share that. One that I saw that was really remarkable reads, Chuck Yeager inspired me as he did many people. All I ever wanted was to fly. I washed out of the U.S. Air Force Academy, where he is revered, halfway through second class year, then lost half a leg when a kid hit my motorcycle and wound up graduating from the University of Charleston, West Virginia in 1983. Chuck Yeager spoke at the commencement, something I still consider something of a miracle. I was lucky enough to meet him in the parking lot And when I mentioned the Air Force Academy, he looked me right in the eye. I am a jet pilot now. That moment in West Virginia was pivotal. Thank you, Chuck. God bless. Godspeed. Rest in peace. Stories like that, you know, we only find them in these guestbook entries, in the obituaries. You know, it's these moments when someone dies that touch others enough to share these little stories that You know, there may never have been an occasion to put out there in the world before. But when you hear them, you just realize how every one of these lives touches others. Mm -hmm. You know, another remarkable pilot whose story we recently told was Dorothy Cole. She died earlier this year at 107, and she had been the oldest living U.S. Marines veteran. But... Since the military was a little bit different back then than it was now, she didn't actually fly for the Marines. She wanted to. She had dreamed of flying ever since she was young. And in order to try and convince the military that she could fly for them, she got her private pilot's license before she enlisted. Then she became one of the very first women to enlist in the brand new Women's Reserve Marine Corps. But instead of getting a chance to fly for her country... Instead, the military made her a secretary. Oh, they didn't. It was really common for women at that time. Women didn't get to fight or fly uh, in the military in World War II, really. But still, she was a Marine and they put her to work. Yeah, she served in the Marines for two years and then she went on to work at the Ames Research Center, which later became part of NASA. I can't get over how many different kinds of veterans are dying now so many years after World War II. Tell us some of the other stories that have captured your attention lately. You know, I've written so many of these obituaries recently that I could keep doing this for a long time, but I'll just share a few more of the ones that that really fascinated me. One of them was Robert Kehoe. He died last year, and his story is intertwined with the French Resistance, which I feel like is is such a There's so much romance and intrigue involved with the French resistance. I I just always love hearing those stories. Sure. He was actually a part of the the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was kind of the precursor to the CIA. And basically his job was to kind of mess with the Germans. 
<laughs> they would do they would do little things like they would disable a German tank or they would bomb a single train car that was carrying Nazi supplies and just make things hard for the Nazis in advance of a, an invasion from the Allies. So they were making things hard for the Nazis in order to make it easier for the Allies. So he was a military grade troll. Yes. Yes. And I love this. Their motto, the motto of the OSS was surprise, kill, vanish. <laughs> Do you love that? I love that. I've never heard that. He was also helping the French resistance um, by, you know, he would organize airdrops of supplies and weapons to help the French resistance fight against the Nazis, too. He just did all kinds of little behind the scenes things in order to make things easier for the allies and surprise, kill, vanish. <laughs> I love that. Another one wa that I just recently wrote was Henry Parham. He died on the 4th of July, 2021, which is very fitting for an American hero like him. He was part of that big cinematic thing that you mentioned earlier. He landed on the beach at Normandy on D-Day, but he was a soldier in the only all black unit to land on the beach that day. Their job was to deploy barrage balloons, which was something that I had never heard of before. It, it, they were large helium-filled balloons that were deployed above the beach, and they made it hard for the German bombers. Basically, they would have to try and drop their bombs around these big balloons or fly at higher altitudes. They also placed small explosives on these balloons, and when the German planes did try to fly lower... They could get tangled up. These little explosives could damage their wings and propellers. Uh, he and his battalion were on the beach for over two months, just trying to stay alive and trying to keep these balloons in the air. And as far as anybody knows, he was the last living black soldier who was on the beach on D-Day. Wow. Just one more story to share with you in service of this idea that all different kinds of people fought in this war and all different kinds of our last veterans of World War II are dying these days, was Robina Asti. She was a World War II veteran who later became an inspiration to the transgender community. Because when she fought in World War II in the U.S. Navy, she identified as a man at that time. She was installing radios and aircraft working in the Pacific Theater. A couple decades after the war, in the 1970s, she began her transition. She later married a man. And after he died... About a decade ago, she filed to receive his social security benefits, but she was denied her claim because according to her birth certificate, she was a man at the time of her marriage. And that disqualified her by the rules at the time? Yeah, that she was not able to get the benefits because of the law. But she fought to receive those benefits. Not only did she get those benefits, but she inspired the Social Security Administration to change the law so that this won't happen to anybody else in the future. That's quite a legacy right there. Well, as if that wasn't enough, she was also a flight instructor all her life. And at the time of her death, she was in the process of being certified by Guinness World Records as the world's oldest flight instructor. I love hearing these stories of people who kept reinventing themselves. You know, each chapter of their life comes to a close and then something entirely different. And we discover that all the time in these obituaries, right? The longer someone lives, you know, the more surprises there are for us. Mm -hmm. And it's worth noting that these stories we've been telling today have in great part been found in the obituaries for people who made headlines when they died, uh, even if they weren't huge headlines. Um, these were people whose stories were known well enough that a reporter wanted to make sure it was preserved. But there are so many more stories of World War II veterans being told in the local family obituaries we see in the news every day. And a lot of those cross our eyes at Legacy. And that's where so much of the work of preserving this history actually exists, is in the obituaries we're writing for our grandparents and great-grandparents. I saw one just recently that I wanted to note. Here's an obituary for Ralph Arnold, who passed away just this year in 2021. 
and his obituary appears on Legacy through Madison.com. And I'm just going to read a couple of sentences to give you an idea of the flavor of the storytelling we see. It says, in September 1943, Ralph landed in Salerno, Italy, as part of the first wave of Allied forces to arrive on the European mainland. He fought at the Rapido River and the breakout from Anzio that led to the liberation of Rome. One of Ralph's most vivid memories of World War II was how the citizens of Rome joyfully greeted them, shouting, Americanos! Americanos! And it goes on to talk more about his experiences in the war before moving on to telling the story of the rest of his life, which of course is most of his life because these war stories are both so profound and at the same time, you know, chronologically such a brief moment in the life of someone who has lived another 75 years since. But they stuck with people so much that their families knew that it was worth talking about them in their obits. There are so many tidbits like this in just hundreds and hundreds of obits across legacy.com. There are. And we're going to keep digging up stories like that to share in episodes to come. That's our show for today. Thank you, Linnea. And thank you to legacy.com, where you can now honor a loved one's memory by planting memorial trees in their name. Just visit Legacy.com slash trees. To hear more life stories like these, you can subscribe to Immortalized on your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just look up Legacy.com on YouTube. And if you're on Facebook, you can follow Legacy.com there for daily updates. Thanks for listening.